All right, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are joining us from. I'm Dave Broadbent, ABYC's Education Director, and I'm joined here with Mike Boniker, our lead instructor. Uh, thanks again for attending uh, another one of our webinars. I know we're spaced them out a little bit and we've got some great topics. Uh, this one will be a little different. Uh, we hope you enjoy it, but uh, we're gonna get right into it here. So first off, uh, we uh, were able to get some sponsors for these things. We're really excited having these guys on board. So first off, I wanna thank Adapt the Rule and Dial them, uh, Safe Harbor Marinas and Vetus Maxwell uh, as our uh, premier uh, supporting numbers here. Uh, and then we have our supporting uh, SAMS organization who also is sponsoring these webinars. So uh, we thank our sponsors a lot. It's, it's really great. They help these things go on. Uh, we put a ton of work into these trying to get them out there. Uh, so thank you to them. And we do have some sponsorship opportunities available. So if you're interested, uh, you can reach out to Shannon. Her email is uh, down below there. All right, updates. It's been a while since we've had some good updates. So uh, we're really excited to announce, most of you have probably seen it, but we do have our virtual standards week. Uh, it's stretched out a little bit. Uh, so we have a save the date out from that. So it is gonna run from January 5th uh, to the 21st. Uh, we have our annual meeting, which is gonna be uh, January 5th with a little bit of a virtual uh, happy hour. So uh, please join us for that. And then our PTC meetings, will be, uh, they will be running from January 11th to January 21st. So if you have interested in that or have never participated in a PTC, uh, we're always looking for new members. That's the side of the world I came from. Uh, it's a really cool process and getting to be a part of, uh, you know, keeping boats safe. Uh, I think it's important. I enjoyed it, but I got paid to do it. But uh, I think everyone would enjoy it. Uh, you can always sit in on meetings. Uh, so please, if you're interested, uh, look, at, look out for that and uh, participate in some of those. This year, we also are doing a SureTech event. Uh, which is a surveyor and technician training. So a little bit different from how we do our, uh, our law symposium, uh, but it's gonna be a similar format, only virtual. So uh, look out for registration for that also. That's gonna be January 6th and 7th. And then we are offering, we generally always offer a course uh, in line with standards week. So we have a standard certification course uh, that is gonna be January 26th to the 28th. So any of that stuff you're interested in, keep an eye out. I believe the standards course is open for registration now. Uh, our webinars, once again, we have a bunch coming up here. Uh, they're always open to members first, but then it's open registration. So make sure you get in early. And we don't plan on stopping these. So, uh, you know, we're going to take a break after January for not even sure how long at this point, probably not long. So we're going to start uh, picking up and getting into some new, po uh, new topics pretty quickly. So if you want to see anything, please let me know. Uh, our class scheduling, uh, we have our class scheduled out past April 2021 for our virtual classes. So take a look at that. If you're looking to get any certification, we did just add a new electrical fast track, which is a shorter version of the electrical. So it's not three weeks. I believe it's three sessions uh, with some, uh, some online learning tied into that. So if you're looking for a quicker way to get your electrical or you're a little rusty and want to try it again, uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at that course. All right, uh, as always, we do offer CEUs for these courses. So uh, at the tomorrow, you'll get a follow-up email from GoToWebinar that will have a link to apply for those CEUs. Um, if uh, you're watching this on YouTube, a link will pop up at the end of this uh, in order to uh, apply for those uh, CEUs. So any questions during this, uh, there's a little question box, please enter it there. Uh, we're gonna get to them. Uh, the way this is broken down, I'll go into a little bit more. We may try to take some questions along the way. Webinar will be November 5th, same time, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and it's going to be about propeller selection. And uh, we have Yamaha agreed to present on that topic. So really excited to have them here. Uh, it's a topic I don't know much about. So I'm excited to, uh, to be here to watch that. So mark your calendar. Uh, like, like always, we'll send the registration out earlier in that week. So uh, if you can't catch it, you can always catch it on YouTube. So let's get into what we're going over today. So the genesis of today's webinar uh, was uh, IBEX had its education sessions and we supplied uh, or provided rather a handful of our online learning courses to their education training sessions. So people were able to watch one on bow thrusters, um, seacocks and through hole fittings, AC dock pedestal testing. So we wanted to make sure we touched on some of that. Uh, whether you've seen them or not is, is pretty relevant at this point. It may help a little, but the idea is kind of getting behind the scenes um, with Mike Boniker, who's the other guy on the screen here, 
and talking a little bit about the what makes these things tick and some of the questions that have come up along the way uh, that may not have been covered or people are just curious about. So it's going to be kind of a fireside chat here. I'm going to be asking Mike some questions here. Uh, we've got some pictures we're going to go through here. So please ask questions. Uh, while Mike's talking, I may try to answer some along the way. If we don't get to them then, though, as always, we'll get to them at the end of the, uh, the full presentation here. Um, with that, I, I know I've been on here 13 or 14 times, but uh, I wanted to give everyone a proper introduction to myself, and then Mike will introduce himself, and then uh, we'll roll right into this. So uh, like I mentioned, I'm ABYC's Education Director. I've been here for five plus years now. Uh, I started in our tech department, so I started in the standards process, which is a lot of fun, like I said. So I, I do miss it sometimes, but it's, uh, it's, it's also great working over here. So yeah, before that, I, I had a whole different career in sales, and I was a military officer and all this stuff, but uh, I've been doing this for a while now, and I'm, I'm really happy with it. So Mike, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I am Mike Boniker, ABYC's lead instructor. Uh, I've been uh, working for ABYC for about a year and a half now, uh, although I've been involved with them since I got my first uh, certification more than 20 years ago when I first started working in the uh, boatyard business. Uh, worked for five or six years as a tech, uh, moved up into management uh, at a fairly decent sized yard in Baltimore, was a production manager there for 15 years. Uh, so uh, there's a fair amount of this stuff I've, I've seen firsthand uh, and have a lot of firsthand knowledge. Uh, that hopefully I can answer any questions that might come up. All right, thanks, Mike. And two pro program, uh, pro programming notes here real quick. I have gotten a few comments about why my hair is long. AB, ABYC does pay me fine. I just uh, haven't gotten a haircut yet. I'm trying to make it a year, which will be January. And a couple of people commented about my background change last week or, or last webinar. I was in an RV uh, on the road, so good eyes. And uh, I'm glad you guys are paying attention. So... <laughs> With that, Mike, we could drop off our cameras for now. We'll pop up in the end uh, for question and answer, and uh, we'll get into this here. All right. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about uh, as one of the topics that we uh, provided for IBEX, and it's one of our online courses, uh, was installing a bow thruster. So there's a lot of work that goes into this. And going through it and talking to people, I came up with some questions that uh, either could use some clarification or I was just curious about here. Uh, so we're going to go through some of these and we got the pictures to go along with it. And uh, me and Mike are just going to go back and forth and, uh, and run with it. So uh, we'll start at the beginning, Mike. So let's start with the basics. Can you briefly describe all the major steps in installing a bow thruster for those that haven't done it or, or didn't get a chance to watch our online learning? Sure, uh, it's 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 not a, it's not rocket science, but it's also not uh, to be attempted by the faint of heart. Uh, you're going to be making some pretty big holes uh, in somebody's boat, uh, and it does take a fair amount of uh, skill to uh, to do it properly with uh, with no repercussions. Um, really, one of the main issues uh, is having someone who is uh, adept at uh, fiberglass. Uh, structural fiberglass work. Uh, the, the cutting of the hole, uh, you know, the steps are, you know, A, you got to figure out which thruster you need. Uh, B, probably one of the most critical critical parts is figuring out where the tube is going to go. Um, most uh, manufacturers have a spec for how far below the water line they want the top of the tube. Uh, usually it's at least a half a tube diameter. Um, sometimes it's more than that. And then it's a matter of figuring out where inside the boat the accommodations lend themselves to being uh, having access to that point. Um, not just for doing the work, but to accommodate the bow thruster motor itself. Um, so there's a lot of considerations there. Um, cutting the hole, uh, glassing the tube in, um, and then mounting the structure on the tube. Uh, and doing uh, whatever electrical wiring is necessary. Uh, that can be, uh, it can be somewhat uh, intimidating. You're using some fairly large cabling in a lot of, uh, a lot of occasions. Um, best, best possibility is if you're gonna, or can also have the capacity to install another battery, a uh, separate battery near the thruster itself uh, so that you don't have to run extra large cables uh, all the way from the battery bank, which may be in the back of the boat somewhere, 
Um, but those are the basic steps uh, as far as uh, as the process goes. All right. And, and on that same kind of note from you know, your previous experience, as well as this install uh, we did for this training, is there any key advice you would give to a technician or business that's thinking about doing this for the first time that hasn't and it's just, you know, someone approaches them with a the job and they think, OK, well, I can do this. Uh, is there anything pitfalls or anything you'd recommend there? Uh, again, probably it is having having the ability to do the glass work. Um, uh, aside from you know installing the thruster and having the thruster work properly, uh, you know you, you've you've put two very large holes uh, in the boat, uh, and the tube that gets uh, glassed in there uh, has got to be done um, to a, a very high level uh, to avoid any issues uh, with it possibly coming loose in the future. Right, and kind of on that same note too, uh, what do you think the most important factor when considering installing? You know, is it the the measurements where it's located, those kind of things? Really, the most important factor is probably the choice of the thruster itself. Um, for most boats and for most manufacturers that I've seen, uh, you will probably wind up with uh, two choices at least uh, as far as a particular uh, thruster that you can put in and. The biggest parameter as far as, you know, the choice between those, uh, of course, one is going to be stronger than the other, um, but still rated to be installed in, you know, X size boat, um, is that you've got to figure out, uh, you know, you've got to realize what kind of boat you're putting this thing in. Uh, if it's a power boat, kind of like we're seeing here, it's got a flybridge, fair amount of windage. Uh, you're definitely going to need to go with the more powerful of the two. Uh, you know, yes, the more powerful one is going to be more expensive. Uh, and people like to just say, oh, yeah, I'll take the cheaper one. Um, and it will cost them less in the beginning, um, but their, uh, their probable uh, dissatisf dissatisfaction or being dissatisfied with the one that they chose and, and the operation of it is probably not going to be the best in the end. Uh, you know, if you've got a small, uh, a smaller boat, even you can compare two 40-foot boats, uh, one flybridge and one not. Um, where you know, if you have a flybridge motor yacht, 40 foot, it's got a whole lot more windage uh, than you know a 40-foot sea wreck, uh, something like that. Uh, so those are the things that uh, that really matter uh, between different power boats, between power boats and sailboats. Um, the choice of the thruster is is probably absolutely the most uh, the most important factor. All right. And yeah. Just so people know, this boat is our our educational platform here. Uh, it's our uh, the Great Catch. It's called our our 37 foot Californian, and uh, that's the boat that this is installed on. So uh, if you watch the video, that's awesome. There's some really cool stuff there. Um, so how long would it typically take to install a, a bow thruster? I know from my experience watching, you know. When you're cutting video, it's easy to uh, make it seem short. But how long would it really take from kind of uh, selection to launching it back in the water for testing? I mean, once you have the materials in hand, um, you know, it, it's probably it's probably a, a three to four day job in most cases. It, it, you know, if, if the yard or whomever has a crew to get on it and stay on it and do it. Uh, as long as there's no pitfalls along the way, which all of us who have worked in the in the marine industry long enough know that things don't always happen in a straight line. Um, at the you know having that giant or having a hole saw, which we'll see here in a minute, uh, or if you've seen the video, uh, to cut that hole uh, certainly shortens the time. Uh, but even even uh, even if you don't have the hole saw uh, within a week, uh, again the ease of uh, of uh, the electrical inside, uh, access, running cables, whether you have to run cables all the way from the bow back to uh, a battery bank back in the back in the back of the boat, or if you're installing another battery up at the at the bow thruster, and sometimes there's not inherent accommodation for that. You've got to build platforms. Um, you know, depending on the boat, it, it can run the gamut. But uh, you know, and not that it's not that it's 40 hours of work, but uh, you know, 40 hours in a week, you, you know, you're going to have a couple different guys on the boat. So it may actually be more than 40 hours. Uh, but uh, somewhere in there, you know, the guys that do it all the time, uh, 
uh, Florida Mouth Roasters that helped us out. Um, I think with two guys, it took them, I think they were there three or four days. Um, I mean, it's probably for two guys who do it all the time and it's, and it's, uh, pretty second nature, uh, not a whole lot of second guessing, um, no uncertainties for the most part. And we actually made it very easy on them in this installation, uh, for accommodation wise, because of this just being our project, but I don't think we have any pictures of that, but um one of the first things we did was just take all the the berth and cabinetry out of the viper uh as a wide open space it allowed us to film we wouldn't have been able to film it otherwise uh but that completely eliminated the issue of uh having to find uh accommodation for the for the tube and the unit because we were able to cut a hole hole in the floor right where we wanted it uh, after we took the uh cabinetry out and it wasn't any big deal but uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of side things that can come up um, but, uh, yeah, somewhere in that realm. All right. And kind of on the same line of time, um, when you're drilling that hole kind of from measuring to, to finish, what kind of time frame was that piece just specifically? Was that, uh, you know, I know if we're talking about a week for the whole thing, was that a day? Was that half a day? Yeah, it was probably, it was probably about half a day. Uh, and again, that's with two guys who that's all they do is install these bow thrusters. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so they're, they're very proficient at it. Uh, as far as marking it out. Now, if you don't have that giant hole saw, um, the, the ones that I was involved in, we did not have a hole saw like that. And we had a, we had a jig, uh, a rod jig made up where once you made your hole on either side, uh, where it's all been triangulated and you know you have a hole or, or a center spot at the same point on each side, uh, you drill a hole there, slide the rod through, and it had a, a jig attached to the rod that would scribe the circle uh, on the side of the hall because you're not dealing with uh, the shape of what you cut out is not actually round uh, because you're you're dealing with an angled it's not all on the same plane it, yeah, it's a circle uh, but it's a circle uh, across a diagonal um, so the jig would allow you to scribe essentially a circle but once you actually scribe the hole or scribe the lines it was not circular it's more egg shaped or, or oval uh, depending on the flare of the bow, but uh, yeah, with that with that hole saw, that that really makes quick work of it. Half a day. I mean, in most cases, I would think you more than likely you're going to have an idea ahead of time to a certain extent. Um, you know, you should have checked out before you buy all the materials. Yeah, can we get this thing in there? Where to a certain extent, where it's going to go? Uh, then it's just uh, figuring out how far below the water line it needs to be checking inside to see what the accommodation is, and is usually a, a give and take of uh, parameters as to how far forward or back it's going to be or how low or high it's going to be, as long as it's within spec, depending on what the interior structure is uh, allowing you to get to the, uh, the motor mounting area inside the boat. All right, and on that same one, I'm just showing here the picture. Uh, is it as easy as they made it look drilling through yeah, there? I mean, uh, a gentleman whose name is Jamaica. He's he's uh, built like a linebacker, uh, and 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 that that uh, that thing will spin you around if it gets hung up. And that's that's nothing to play with. Uh, you see, there's another guy there in the background. He's uh, squirting soapy water on it to keep it lubricated so that it doesn't hang up. Um, it, it makes quick work of it, but you really got to know what you're doing to to use that whole song. Yeah, it definitely looked like it. Uh, when you're dealing with the tube that actually is going to be uh, glassed in. Where do you find a tube like that? Uh, in almost all cases, it comes from the manufacturer. Uh, you order a you order a, a unit, uh, and they will and they'll supply the correct tube to go along with. All right, and uh, a little farther on in this in this process, uh, there's a concept of it creating a, a brow uh, for the the tube hole. There, can you talk about that a little bit and the purpose of it and why you do it? Sure. Uh, once you drill the hole through the hull, the two holes, if you were to look at it dead on from the bow uh, with the tube in place, because of the flare of the bow and how the bow gets wider as it goes back, um, you're going to have a flat spot facing dead forward. Uh, the back of the tube is going to be facing dead ahead and exposed uh, outside the flare of the bow on the forward edge of the tube. So 
Uh, I've seen it done a couple of different ways. Uh, the conventional, fairly conventional way is to build a brow. It's called a brow on the front side of the tube uh, to def deflect water past that flat spot, which would be the back of the tube. And I've also seen um, where they have made cutouts, uh, a dished, it's hard to explain it, uh, on the back side, on the hull, uh, from the back side of the tube, uh, sort of recessing that area to get it to um, where the front of the tube is as far as width uh, so that you don't have that, you wouldn't have that hard deflection of water uh, hitting off the back of the tube. It has the ability to, to slide by as the boat moves forward. All right. And let's talk about the electrical system a little bit here. Uh, how is it, you know, is it different than a household? Do you have to have a second battery? I know in this instance, and probably a lot, they do install a second battery and a second charging system. Is that required or is there some major differences you need to take into consideration? Yeah, the biggest issue with not installing a dedicated battery is that uh, you know, these units have a, it's brief, usually fairly brief, uh, but very high amperage draw. Um, and I have seen, I've been a party to a couple of instances where, um, depending on how the boat is set up, uh, one of them was a very large Hatteras, an older Hatteras. And every time they, they keyed the, uh, keyed the bow thruster, the bolt drop would be so much that the, uh, the electronics would blink out and most of the electronics will go out. You know, the voltage gets below 11 and a half. Uh, it would set the engine alarms off. <laughs> this was a big, big electric thruster. Um, so in the end, we ended up, I think, installing a, a, a battery bank of three 8Ds uh, with its own charging system uh, to run that thruster so that when the thruster ran, it did not affect uh, anything else on the boat. Uh, we chose to, because we had the space, you can see where, uh, I can't remember his name, the guy who was working with Jamaica, that's terrible. Um, where the electrician was doing the work, you can see that's there was a V berth there. Um, you can sort of see in the background where the cut line is. Um, it's ducting there for an air condition that was underneath that uh, the, that berth there. But having cut that out, you know, we had the easy ability to uh, install another battery, battery charger, um, basically make this a, a standalone system by itself, and it's a it's a good way to go if you can accommodate it uh, for that reason and, and others. Yeah, and kind of on that same note, how do you size the conductors for this? When I was in the tech department, we used to get calls and people would say, hey, this draw is X amount. When I put it into the calculator, it, it's overloaded. You guys don't have a table for that. So how do you size the conductors appropriately for these? Well, you can always use the, um, oh, I can't think of the word I want to use, the formula, sorry, uh, for calculating circular mills. Uh, and that can tell you, for the most part, it comes down to the manufacturer. The manufacturer will usually spec a minimum size, but it doesn't always hold uh, hold to the letter because uh, if you're in a scenario where you've got to run cable a long distance, it's possible that the even the minimum size cable that the manufacturer is recommended uh, won't be big enough. And again, it comes down to distance. Uh, that's the other, you know, the big benefit of installing it's a dedicated battery somewhere near the thruster itself, so that you're not running uh, that same uh, same job I was talking about with the uh, the issue with the voltage drop affecting all the electrical and electronics. Um, that boat we ended up having to run 250 MCM, uh, which is a size up from four odd. Uh, just honking big cable. And it really wasn't all that, it was far, but it wasn't that far. Um, Hatteras, I think it was a 65, maybe a 70. You know, it's front of the engine room where the batteries were, but uh, it was still, you know, 50, 60, 70 foot circuit. Uh, and this thing drew a massive amount of power. So uh, most of the time in, in, uh, smaller I'd call them normal size <laughs> motor situations where you've got an amperage draw three four hundred amps uh, the manufacturer's recommendation for minimum sizes is, is probably going to be fine but you may want to re run the calculation uh, the MCM the circular mill conversion calculation uh, just to make sure that you're you know somewhere near 
at least near that that maximum of of 10 percent bull drop we do have a couple of questions that came in and uh, can this be tied could this forward bank be tied into the house bank uh it can um but again you're going to have to run in order to do it you're going to have to run cable the size that that unit is going to draw at the at the at the rated size from that forward battery to the aft bank usually the biggest parameter issue with putting a dedicated battery up is getting charging there from uh engine source now we we put the own we put a, a battery charger it, its own battery charger in which is fine but again most people want to be able to charge that battery from their uh their engine uh, alternator charging as well which is which is easy to do with uh, charge relays and things of, of that nature uh, but as far as you know, trying to add capacity from this battery plus the house bank, uh, it's really not going to, it's not the optimum way to go because you're going to have to run big cables between the house bank and this battery uh, just the same as you would have to run between the house bank and the, uh, and the thruster if that battery didn't exist. And Ron commented that you should get a naval arc or a structural component to structurally locate. And fortunately, Rod, we had the application engineer from the manufacturer help us with that. So we kind of were able to get ahead there a bit. Uh, one last question, you know, maintenance wise, is there anything specific you should be looking looking out for uh, with that? Um, it's not a whole lot of maintenance that has to be done on these. They have anodes, most of them do, uh, depending on the construction. Um, Ones that have plastic, uh, Vetus side power, uh, they have plastic blades, most of them, on their propellers. Uh, occasionally, some of them have, some of the bigger ones have an anode behind the, uh, behind the blades. Some of them have an, a little anode, which a lot of people don't know about because it's usually not there. Uh, there's a small anode that on the oil-fed systems, the one that had the the one that we installed uh, does not have an oil reservoir uh, so it does not have a drain plug on it uh, a lot of older units and larger units will have an oil drain plug right on the bottom of that leg that's installed in the uh, in the tube um, and it will have an oil reservoir load that has to be located above the water line somewhere uh, the purpose of that of the reservoir is to keep positive pressure uh, of oil down into uh, the unit, uh, whereby if it developed a seal leak of some sort, it would allow uh, oil to leak out versus allow uh, versus allowing water to come into the unit. Uh, uh, but most of the newer units are completely sealed, like the one we installed on this boat. It does not have the oil reservoir. That's one thing to check on older boats uh, that do uh, a make sure that reservoir the reservoir really shouldn't move uh, unless there is a leak. So that's a fair indicator of uh, a seal leak uh, on the uh, on the rotor shafts uh, on the lower unit. So a lot of people call it different things. It's the, the lower leg, the, the lower unit that actually mounts in the tube uh, versus the motor assembly that mounts on the outside of the tube inside the boat. Um, and uh, anodes, anodes in the oil, uh, there's not a whole lot more to look for. You know, Be aware of uh, corrosion issues if you see anything crazy. Uh, almost all those lower units, uh, lower leg units are made of bronze. Uh, so there's usually not usually too much of an issue there, but anodes is the, is the, is the number one upkeep issue on that. All right. And another question here, if you're, when fiberglass in the tube in, what changes would you recommend for a cord hole from uh, Steve here? Um, it's not a whole lot different that has to be done, except you would certainly want to isolate the core, um, give yourself a, um, a solid area to dig out. Once you drill the hole through, um, is to isolate that core and seal that core just in case you get a leak. Uh, but there's not, I can't say I've ever dealt with one or been involved with one that was done on a cord hull. Uh, so I don't want to profess any super expertise there but dealing with halls cord halls in in other aspects um is not a whole lot i don't think that you have to worry the other thing that could be done which i think i've seen is that on the inside of the boat uh you would you drill your hull through or make your two holes on either side and then inside the boat you would take the inner skin and the hull away 
to a, uh, a diameter probably somewhere about twice as big as the uh, as the size of the hole that you went through. So that when you're glassing, you're glassing to the solid surface, the outer skin, uh, and really creating uh, a heavy duty a solid fiberglass layer there. Right, and the last two questions are to tied together on this topic uh, from David is, is, is there any special consideration with tying into the bonding system? And uh, we had a comment from our good friend, Charlie, who said, in general, bow thrusters should not be bonded. Uh, so from your experience, Mike, do you have any input on that? Yeah, most manufacturers do not want their uh, units bonded. Um, it's funny, I'm actually in the middle of uh, teaching, I'll be teaching corrosion uh, next week, and there's a, a prime example in there of what could happen when you don't bond. Uh, there was an accidental DC short to the case of the uh, of the thruster, uh, and it dissolved that that bronze lower leg uh, in about two days. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a pretty some pretty dramatic pictures. Um, but they manufacturers are more worried about uh, the the inherent the inherence of causing problems by bonding, you know, whereby you attach this piece of metal to uh, all the rest of your underwater pieces of metal, uh, dependent upon uh, upkeep of anodes to keep them from corroding. Um, they'd rather have these systems uh, isolated. Uh, versus bonded to the rest of the boat, uh, whereas they, you know, the leave straight current is a, a much less likely event, which it is, uh, but it's also much more catastrophic if it happens. Right. Let's move on to our next topic here. Another one of our courses here that's AC dock pedestal testing. Um, so just right off the bat, Mike, you know, why should you be testing your shore power at the pedestal or, or what's the importance of doing that kind of testing? Well, there's a couple of different scenarios there. Um, one is, you know, especially if you're troubleshooting or have an issue on the boat, you got to confirm that you have at the pedestal what you think you have, uh, that you have 120 or 240 volts, that you have 60 hertz. Uh, but then you're also looking for things like um, straight current uh, in in that, and I mean, in the shore cable in the system, um, and whether or not the, you have a, a good ground uh, that, you know, there, there's a, a lot of issues caused by poor ground systems in marina wiring um, and uh, testing the, the dock pedestal can, uh, so it, it, Rob, Rob there is using a, an ideal shore test, uh, which can run a, a gamut of uh, testing parameters uh, on an AC system. Uh, tell you a lot of things, uh, uh, give you an idea of the condition of that, of that shore power pedestal and the wiring to it. Yeah, and kind of following up on that, I think one of the bigger issues, and, and I know Mike, you harp in a lot, a lot of our instructors do, and uh, yeah, maybe not get, might not get out there enough, is electroshock drowning. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very important. I know we're all very passionate about it. Uh, you know, I pulled some of your slides, Mike. Do you wouldn't mind talking through that a little bit for those who either don't know or, or want to learn a little bit more? Um, I have them here for you. Sure, absolutely. Um, electric shock drowning is uh, mostly a problem in freshwater areas. Um, how it happens, why it happens, uh, is because either fresh and brackish water to a certain extent are poorer conductors, uh, much uh, much poorer conductors than salt water is. Um, you know, current, we talk about current, how does current flow? Um, Current moves by electron movement in conductors, but it moves through ions in the water. And ions can be, you know, ions are basically charged particles. Uh, and uh, salt is a great ion. Uh, it, it is a, it's a, along with uh, pollution, uh, things of that nature. Uh, even in fresh water, uh, highly polluted water uh, has a lot of ions in it and is a pretty, fairly good conductor. Um, but since ions allow electricity to flow through water, the more on my ions, the better. Uh, your body, which consists mostly of salt water, is an extremely good conductor of electricity. It has lots of ions in it. Uh, salt uh, is a very good conductor. 
so in the water, in fresh water, uh, any body of water that has a lack of ions is not a good conductor. Uh, the human body becomes a much better conductor of electricity than the water does its, itself. Uh, you know, we become a conductor in fresh or brackish water. Next slide. You can see here uh, some measurements of effects of straight current, ground fault straight current effects. Um, one milliamp is a tingle. Uh, most GFCIs uh, trip between somewhere between you know three and seven, four and six milliamps is the trip uh, the fault level uh, for tripping a GFCI. Uh, where we start to get into trouble is around the 15 milliamp range. Um, what 15 milliamps does is it leads to paralysis. Uh, electric shock drowning, it, it, the electricity does not kill you. Uh, what happens is, is it paralyzes your muscles and it uh, prevents you from being able to swim. Uh, hence, you drown. Um, so that is the, that's the crux of electric shock drowning is this fairly, you know, 15 milliamps we're talking about, uh, of being able to uh, paralyze muscles in the human body uh, whereby you can no longer keep yourself afloat and thereby you drown. Next. Uh, so common causes, poor marine wiring, poor grounding, uh, automotive battery chargers uh, can be a big problem. You see them a lot on smaller boats. Uh, the problem is that on that battery charger, the neutral and the ground are tied together. Um, which provides a path uh, if you get a, uh, a ground fault uh, to allow AC power into the ground wire. Um, you also have AC conductors chafed against the hull or equipment. Um, sometimes you can find that the green grounding wire has been bypassed somewhere. Um, too many grounding points aboard a vessel is also an issue. We want one main grounding point. Um, AC equipment, it's got a short, radiates AC current into the water through the common ground point, which is the engine block through the prop and shaft. ABYC standards require the AC ground to be connected to the DC ground. Uh, and through that way, uh, or through that path, is the way that our AC ground fault gets into the water. Uh, the biggest issue is that um, it tends to be kids. Now, you're talking about people swimming in the water around a boat. Um, or, you know, heaven forbid, yeah, I hate to see anybody swimming in a marina. Uh, you know, it could be around a boat with a generator running. Um, but in a marina, especially, you never want to see anybody swimming in a marina, uh, especially if it's fairly fresh water. Um, but when it happens, people on the dock think, hey, that, that kid or that person's drowning. Uh, so what do they do? They jump in to try to help the person. Um, and can find, them, find themselves in exactly the same situation. So uh, if you ever do experience that, when you see somebody happen to be in that situation, or having trouble swimming around a boat, uh, in a marina especially, make sure all the dock pedestals are shut off uh, within the vicinity uh, as best possible before anybody tries to go in to, to help that person. So you can see there, uh, with a the ground fault, um, you know, fresh water, the current density is very low because it doesn't conduct well, but you actually attract the current to you as a swimmer in the water, uh, which concentrates the current density at the point of you even further. Next. So you can see, even with, a good ground. Um, with a ground fault, we've got we're going to have two paths. You know, because of, because our AC is connected to our DC, connected to the engine, connected to the shaft. Uh, no matter what, some of that fault current is going to go into the water, even if we have a good ground back to shore. Um, next. But if we have a bad ground. The only option is for that current to try to find its way back to the source of power, which is the pedestal, which is going to be through the water to the earth, uh, back to the pedestal ground. Uh, so that is uh, 
that's why we're we're keeping why keeping a a ground wire intact or, or having that ground back to shore uh, is such a, an important aspect ensuring it's intact not only to there but from the pedestal back to the source all right mike we did have one question come in on this uh if someone's diving to clean the hole do they have any protection from electroshock drowning uh no no if uh if you're I see, you know, it's it's you see a fair amount of divers around and you see a fair amount of people that do it themselves. Um, you know, it's much less of an issue in salt water. Uh, you're more than likely going to feel a little bit of a tingle. Uh, but because you're not so much more conductive than the water around you, it's not going to be as much of an issue. But uh, there there is there is nothing there to, to protect uh, from happening if you if you get in the water to, to clean the bottom of your boat. All right, so we have an outboard related question. We'll hold that to our last section here. Let's jump into seacocks and through hole fittings here. So, oh. what are the two most common or what are the most common overlooked uh, maintenance items when you're dealing with seacocks or through holes or anything like that? Mm, you know, regular maintenance, there's not a whole lot of regular maintenance that has to be done. You should always, you know, periodically check, make sure the hoses are decent, make sure the hose clamps are okay. Um, if it's a, a seacock or a through haul, the seacock that does not get actuated much, which many of them do not, um, in the spring, in the fall, maybe you're winterizing, you're commissioning the boat, uh, move them back and forth a couple of times. Uh, you, you get those ones like, uh, like overboard discharges from heads that never get opened. If somebody wants to open it, it's not going to open. Um, so exercising, we refer to that as exercising the through haul, exercising the seacock, sorry. Uh, the through hole is the piece that goes through the hole. The seacock is the valve. Uh, so exercise the valve on a regular basis, at least, at least once a year. Uh, that's, that should do. A, we'll do a lot to to keep the uh, keep the valve operable when you want to be able to operate it. You know, say you know it's open. It's, I mean, most most through holes stay open forever. Um, people don't close them. Uh, well, if you get a broken hose and you want to shut it, you could be in trouble. Yeah, and this, this picture I have up there now, we actually did this as one of our what's wrong with this pictures thing. And, and the big issue is you can tell that second hose clamp isn't doing much on the barb there. Uh, yeah, so the way it's about it. off to the side. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, it's one of those uh, misconceptions of uh, the requirement of two hose clamps on the through all that is uh, under ABYC standards, that is not a requirement. Um, ISO, European standards, uh, you will see some European boats that do have two hose clamps on a seacock because that is an ISO standard. Uh, but there are only two places that ABYC requires uh, two hose clamps. One is on uh, flexible exhaust system component uh, junctions, uh, and the other is on fuel fill, both at the fuel fill um, fitting on the deck and at the tank. So fuel fill hose has got to be double clamped at both ends. Uh, any flexible exhaust hose has got to be double clamped. That is the only place that ABYC requires two clamps. And you can see here, you know, a lot of times, especially on smaller hose sizes, uh, there's not enough room. The, the barb is not long enough to get two hose clamps on. And by installing that second hose clamp, which is either going to be just on the very end of the, the pipe to hose fitting, the hose barb, uh, or may even be beyond it. Uh, it's either going to crush it, uh, can cut into it, uh, the end of the hose barb can cut into the inside of the hose. Uh, so in a lot of cases where they don't fit properly, they do more harm than good. All right. So next on that, um, you know, Marlon FRP fittings, are they good? Or are they bad? I mean, I think there's a lot of people and have a lot of misconceptions out there about those. Do you have any input on that? Um, you still don't see them a whole lot, but there's, they're, they're great as, in, in, in my practical experience. I've had really no problems with them um they you know you've eliminated an underwater metal uh you don't have any any further corrosion issues there uh they're excellent for uh aluminum hauls and if you if you have to add a through haul to an aluminum haul um and especially carbon fiber uh carbon fiber being graphite is uh electrically far more noble than just about any other material that you could put in there except for something that's inert like plastic um, without having to worry about insulating it somehow. So carbon fiber hauls is where you tend to see them the most. 
Um, but uh, no, they are. They, uh, I've seen no longevity issues with them. Um, they are, and they are a special plastic. You cannot just use plastic fittings uh, from the hardware store. Uh, these are uh, Marlon. Uh, they are fiber reinforced uh, plastic that uh, meets specific criteria and are allowable for use below the waterline. All right, and last question on this topic, uh, backing plates. Are they always necessary? What, when should they be used? When should they not be used? Uh, in general, uh, our rule of thumb, we, we always used them. Um, you did have, and you can almost see it in this picture a little bit. Uh, in some boats, in the area where the through hall was, or a through hall was meant to be installed, they would actually build the hull thicker there. Um, the only thing that things this doesn't show is that flange seacock is required to be attached to the hull. Uh, those holes you see should have bolts in them. Um, one way of complying with that uh, is by using one of the backing plates that uh, it's a, a composite fiberglass backing plate that is made to um, accommodate bolts. Uh, for a specific size through hull, uh, and then after the bolts are put through the backing hit plate, the backing plate is then bonded to the inside of the hull. Um, that's a way to comply with that stipulation without actually having to drill holes through the hull, but that's the way it was done. In many older vessels, you will see uh, if you were to take off fair bottom paint and fairing on the outside of the boat where one of these is installed and you happen to see threads coming through those holes, more than likely there's going to be a flathead uh, machine screw uh, on the other side, outside the hull. Uh, that's also sealed. A lot of people don't like to put those extra holes in the hull, uh, but that is the intention of the of those holes uh, in the base. All right, and now we'll move on to our final topic here, which is outboard stir and drive corrosion. Uh, so when you're talking about this, in your experience, and what's the biggest cause of corrosion on outboards and stern drive? Probably the biggest cause is lack of upkeep on the anodes um, and most people's misunderstanding of the properties of outboards and outdrives, stern drives. Um, they, they really were not originally intended to be on boats that, that stayed in the water all the time. Um, you have to have their aluminum, uh, they have to be protected, A, with uh, anodes that are kept up on a regular basis. Uh, they need to have, uh, they need to be coated, uh, not necessarily with anti-fouling, but if the boat stays in the water all the time, it should have some sort of anti-fouling on it. Uh, but that aluminum needs to be insulated from the water as much of it as possible. Uh, and what happens over time, uh, the coating wears away, it chips off, exposing more aluminum which causes the anodes to waste faster, um, which leads to a cycle of, it's mainly a lack of, uh, lack of maintenance that uh, is the biggest issue. And uh, I see Rob's not uh, attending luckily, cause I don't know if he loved that I have that deer in headlights look on his face there that I <laughs> took that screenshot from, but uh, that's okay. Uh, so <laughs> what kind of corrosion protection options are, there, are out there for outboards? What do you usually see? Well, as far as outboards, it's it's pretty much strictly anodes. Uh, for stern drives, uh, it's usually a combination of anodes and some sort of impressed current system, uh, which is the mercathode system in Mercury. I know Volvo has one. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head what they call theirs. Uh, but uh, it's an it's a I don't know how to ex how to explain it or describe it without uh, getting too deep in it. It's actually a a, a system that's connected to uh, the battery power on the boat, which uh, works electrically to produce uh, voltage, much like uh, the anodes do, uh, to help protect the metal even further. Um, so those are really the options. Uh, one thing you have to really look out for uh, on outboard boats people like that keep their boat in the water all the time uh, is trimming the outboard up. You know, they don't want stuff to grow on it. So they'll trim the outboard up all the way, but usually that very bottom corner of the outboard will still be in the water and there is no protection on that part. 
in order to get protection from the anodes, the anodes have to be in the water as well. So uh, you may may keep the, uh, the the fouling off of the outboard, uh, but you may run into corrosion issues with that little part of the outboard lower unit that that still stays below the water. Right. And last question on this uh, bonding. Do you bond these things? Should you? Should you not? Does the manufacturer tell you to? What are your thoughts on bonding? Well, as far as outboards or, or out drives, um, most of the time, the bonding in ABYC world, marine world, bonding means a couple of different things. Uh, it mainly means when we're talking about uh, larger boats, especially sailboats, uh, that have a lot of through hauls, a lot of underwater metals, different underwater metals, and we bond those all together inside the boat uh, with a wire, uh, and which is eventually also attached to an anode somewhere. Um, it, you know, the different components of uh, outboards and outdrives are, they actually have little bonding wires between them to make sure that they are all electrically connected. That's one thing you really need to watch out for. Uh, they're little stainless steel, uh, stranded stainless cables uh, that uh, are usually on screws between um, several of the components of the outboard or outdrive, which are not normally or would not be electrically connected. Those wires are there to make sure that the anodes that are attached to whatever part of that drive uh, can electrically protect uh, the rest that they're not automatically uh, in contact with. Um, but bonding, the only thing you want to watch out with bonding, especially if uh, is mainly when these boats uh, have trim tabs. Uh, the amount of anode on those drives, outboard, stern drive, um, along with the uh, impressed current system, like a mercathode, are specifically designed and set up to be able to protect the drive. Uh, if the boat has trim tabs. The trim tabs in general should not be connected to the bonding system uh, because you have then added a whole bunch more metal uh, to that system that you're then going to ask that system to protect. And it's not normally set up uh, even have the ability to uh, protect that additional metal. So uh, stern drive boats, out, outboard boats that have trim tabs, uh, they should just be individually protected with anodes directly on the trim tabs, uh, not attached to the rest of the uh, cathodic bonding system to try to protect them that way. All right. So that kind of takes us to the end here. I'm going to dig back and get some extra questions here. So first, Mike, uh, from Chris here, uh, any special grounding rules for dual outboards? Uh, there should be... The only thing that I would really be aware of, there should be some sort of bonding between the outboards themselves. Uh, I am not an outboard expert. Uh, the yard that I worked in, we did not deal with outboards a whole lot, um, but it can eliminate some issues if there is some sort of bonding between the two outboards. Uh, other than that, you know, they're, whether they both uh, are fed power from the same battery or two different batteries, if it's two different batteries, again, the batteries, uh, the negatives of the battery should be connected together. Um, so there's no difference in potential there or between the outboards themselves. So uh, that's one thing I could say about outboards. Right. And Charlie commented that this subject does also apply to sail drives and Volvo IPS. So I know you did touch yeah. on Volvo with that. And uh, all right, let's see what else we got up here. Uh, feel free if you guys any other questions coming in feel free to get them over to us I'm just trying to go back a bit here uh, let's see go back uh, someone asked where are the videos these are actually on our uh, like I said they're part of the IBEX sessions and these are part of our uh, our online learning courses so you can purchase them the idea of today wasn't a sales pitch for it just to try to feed off of that and uh, share a little bit of Mike's expertise because uh, you know, he's out there teaching our classes and all, but it, it's great having him in house and his experience is fantastic. So this is, uh, we were kind of touching a little bit of everything. So if you're actually interested in those, we do have some samples on YouTube, but you can actually uh, purchase them on our online learning platform there. Uh, let's see, what else do we get here? Um, all right. 
Uh, where can you purchase a large wholesale for drilling for the bow thrusters? That's an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe, I remember them talking about that hole saw. Uh, it is a, a modified core saw of some sort. Um, I think it was, I don't know if it's still uh, diamond tipped. It might be. Uh, I can't remember for sure, uh, but I have never had to buy one. Um, I would look, if you want to look it up, uh, it's, they call it a core saw, like, you know, taking a core sample, uh, you know, maybe from uh, rock or something like that. Um, but that's that's where they modified that, that whole saw from. Right. And now what, uh, what do you recommend doing with an outboard that is still in the water when in the up position? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. If the if the if the bottom tip of that lower unit does not come all the way out of the water, it, it could have issues. Uh, you know, the big thing is to make sure it's coated. If it's if it's properly coated, problem is that's where it tends to wear, um, depending on the design of that uh, of that lower unit. But as long as it's properly coated and not just anti fouling, it's got to have a barrier coat on it of some sort. Uh, as long as that area is barrier coated, basically isolating the metal from the water. Then you won't have any problem. But you know, the issue happens is that you know if the coating wears off, it wears through. You have exposed aluminum there. You're going to have problems if that outboard doesn't come all the way out of the water. You know the best thing to do would be to leave it all the way down, uh, so that the anodes are also in the, or leave it down enough so that at least the lowest anode is in the water. You'd still have to deal with maybe cleaning a little fouling off of it now and then, but it would protect the unit, whatever part of it's still in the water. Right, and uh, one last comment here. Jason did mention we didn't touch on it, but that isn't the standard the 500 pound load test for Seacox. Uh, so we actually did a test on that that we uh, winched with a load cell and actually winched it building this out to test it. So uh, it, you can test it, it's fun. Uh, but yes, uh, all those things have to have a 500 pound load test. And Mike, I, I believe the background, if you know, I, I was that if you're falling, stepping down. There's a lot more weight than whatever your body weight could be that's going to be falling on it. So I think that's one of the reasons it's 500 pounds and not just the normal human weight. But I'm not sure if you have any comments well, on that. Know, it sounds plausible. I can't say I've ever been privy to <laughs> the exact reason why they came up with 500 pounds. Yeah, that's uh, it's one of those standard things. Like I said, if you're interested in participating in uh, the standards making process, we have those opportunities uh, with the PTCs and especially having a remote this year. If you just want to participate, it's, it's a great thing to do. So uh, we are up against the clock here. <laughs> Ron said, where is the 500 pound surveyor? Not climbing around a boat, I hope, but uh, <laughs> uh, there you go. So uh, I did have our contact info up here. We're available anytime you want. So any questions you guys have about anything ABYC, that's the biggest thing I wanted to get out there today and why it was a little bit different than how we've done it. Uh, so feel free if you have any comments, questions, liked it, hated it, please let me know because uh, it's a little bit different than we've done it. But we have our whole team here. If Mike can't answer it or I can't answer it, we can hand it off to our tech guys who can get you clarification and uh, explain to you things like, why do we have that 500 pound weight? There's minutes of a PTC meeting on how they came up with that number. So uh, once again, there's our contact stuff. Feel free to reach out. Uh, here's the update, uh, the upcoming uh, webinars that we have. Like I said, the next one is propeller selection. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, right around now, Matt's going to pop it up on screen somewhere around my head. Uh, so with that, uh, we're up against the clock here. Uh, sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, but thanks for attending. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will see you guys November 5th. So thanks a lot, Mike. Always appreciated uh, using your knowledge here. And uh, hope everyone stays safe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Right. Take care, everyone.